Hi, I am Maria Cristina Buncalis, your reporter for today. Now, I will present to you the theory of personality of Alfred Adler. Let's start with the biography of Alfred Adler. Alfred Adler was born on February 7, 1870 in Rodolfsheim, a village near Vienna. He died on May 28, 1937. He was an Austrian medical doctor, psychotherapist, and he is known for his theory of personality, the individual psychology. The life of Alfred Adler As a young boy, Adler was weak and sickly. From rockets to pneumonia, he even nearly died because of it at the age of five. Due to his health problem as a child, along with the death of a younger brother, motivated Adler to become a physician. Several of Adler's earliest memories were concerned with the unhappy competition between his brother's good health and his own illness. Simon Adler, the childhood rival whom Adler attempted to surpass, remained a worthy opponent, and in later years, he became very successful in business and even helped Alfred financially. Alfred Adler began his medical career as an ophthalmologist, but he soon switched to general practice and established his office in a less affluent part of Vienna across from the Prater a combination amusement park and circus. His clients included circus people and it has been suggested that the unusual strengths and weaknesses of the performers led to his insights into organ inferiorities and compensation, which we will discuss later on. Adler was initially a colleague of Simon Fraud, helped establish psychoanalysis and was a founding member of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society. Adler's theory focused on looking at the individual as a whole, which is why he referred to his approach as individual psychology. Adler eventually split from Freud's psychoanalytic circle, but he went on to have a tremendous impact on the development of psychotherapy. So now, let's move on to his theory of personality, the individual psychology. Individual psychology presents an optimistic view of people while resting heavily on the notion of social interest, that is, feeling of oneness with all humankind. Individual psychology focused on the uniqueness of each person and denied the universality of biological motives and goals ascribed to us by Simon Freud. As we have seen, Adler was an original member of the small clique of physicians who met in Freud's home on Wednesday evenings to discuss psychological topics. However, when theoretical and personal differences between Adler and Freud emerged, Adler left Freud's circle and established an opposing theory, which became known as individual psychology. Now, let's go to Adlerian theory. To Adler, people are born with weak, inferior bodies a condition that leads to feelings of inferiority and a consequent dependence on other people. Inferiority feelings is a motivating force as to what Adler believes. Therefore, a feeling of unity with others or social interest is inherent in people and the ultimate standard for psychological health. The main tenets of Adlerian theory can be stated in outline form. The following is adopted from a list that represents the final statement of individual psychology.
The first tenet of Adlerian theory is, the one dynamic force behind people's behavior is the striving for success or superiority. Adler reduced all motivation to a single drive, the striving for success or superiority. Individual psychology holds that everyone begins life with physical deficiencies that activate feelings of inferiority, feeling that motivate a person to strive for either superiority or success. Even Adler's own childhood was marked by physical deficiencies and strong feelings of competitiveness with his older brother. Regardless of the motivation for striving, each individual is guided by a final goal. The final goal. According to Adler, people strive toward a final goal of either personal superiority or the goal of success for all humankind. In either case, the final goal is fictional and has no objective existence. Nevertheless, the final goal has great significance because it unifies personality and renders all behavior comprehensively, comprehensible. Each person has the power to create a personalized fictional goal, one constructed out of the raw materials provided by heredity and environment. However, the goal is neither genetically nor environmentally determined. Rather, it is the product of the creati creative power, that is, people's ability to freely shape their behavior and create their own personality. But by the time children reach four or five years of age, their creative power has developed to the point that they can set their final goal. Even infants have an innate drive toward growth, growth, completion, or success. Thus, a person's final goal reduces the pain of inferiority feelings and points that person in the direction of either superiority or success. If children feel neglected or pampered, their goal remains largely unconscious. If children experience love and security, they set a goal that is largely conscious and clearly understood. The striving force as compensation. People strive for superiority or success as a means of compensation for feelings of inferiority or weakness. Adler believed, I mean, these physical deficiencies ignite feelings of inferiority only because people by their nature possess an innate tendency toward completion or wholeness. But what if, um, suppose a child does not grow and develop? What happens when the child is unable to compensate for his or her feeling of inferiority? An inability to overcome inferiority feelings enters intensifies them, leading to the development of an inferiority complex. Inferiority complex is a poor opinion of themselves and feel helpless and unable to cope with the demands of life. Inferiority complex develop when, it, when the infancy and childhood of a person are characterized by a lack of love and security because their parents are indifferent or hostile. And in contrast to this, when a person overcompensate and so develop what Adler called superiority complex, an exaggerated opinion of one's abilities and accomplishments. A person with a superiority complex are given to boasting, vanity, self-centeredness, and a tendency to denigrate others. The striving force itself is innate. 
but its nature and direction are due both the feeling of inferiority and to the goal of superiority. The goal is set as compensation for the deficit feeling, but the deficit feeling would not exist unless a child first possessed a basic basic tendency toward completion. Although the striving for success is innate, it must be developed. At birth, it exists as potentiality, not actuality. Each person must actualize this potential in his or her own manner. Striving for personal superiority are psychologically unhealthy people with little or no concern for others. Their goals are personal ones and their strivings are motivated largely by exaggerated feelings of personal inferiority or the presence of an inferiority complex. Striving for success In contrast to people who strive for personal gain are those psychologically healthy people who are motivated by social interest and the success of all humankind. Adler's second tenet is people's subjective perceptions shape their behavior and personality. People strive for superiority or success to compensate for feelings of inferiority, but the manner in which they strive is not shaped by reality but by their subjective perceptions of reality, that is, by their fictions or ex expectations of the future. Fictionalism Fictional final goal, the idea that we have an ultimate goal, a final state of being, and the need to move toward it. Fiction or ideas that have no real existence, yet they influence people as if they really existed. Example, men are superior to women. Although this notion is, fic is a fiction, many people, both men, men and women, ask, act as if it were, it were a reality. Human beings perpetually strive for the fictional or ideal goal of perfection. So, how in our daily lives do we try to attain this goal? This will be answered in Adler's concept of the style of life, which we will discuss later on. Next is the physical inferiority. Adler insisted that the whole human race is blessed with organ inferiorities. These physical handicaps have little or no importance by themselves, but become meaningful when they stimulate, stimulate subjective feelings of inferiority, which serve as an impetus toward perfection or completion. The third tenet of Adlerian theory is personality is unified and self-consistent. In choosing the term individual psychology, Adler wished to stress his belief that each person is unique and indivisible. We all know that personality is a pattern of relatively permanent traits and unique characteristics that give both consistency and individuality to a person's behavior. Thus, individual psychology, psychology insists insist on the fundamental unity of personality and the notion that inconsistent behavior does not exist. Thoughts, feelings, and actions are all directed toward a single goal and serve a single purpose. Adler recognized several ways in which the entire person operates with unity and self-consistency. 
the first of these he called organ jargon or organ dialect. Organ dialect. The disturbance of one part of the body cannot be viewed in isolation. It affects the entire person. In fact, the deficient organ expresses the direction of the individual's goal, a condition known as organ dialect. Through organ dialect, the body's organs speak a language which is usually more expressive and discloses the individual's opinion more clearly than words are able to do. One example of organ dialect might be a man suffering from rheumatoid arthritis in his hands. His stiff and deformed joints voice his whole style of life. It is as if they cry out, See my deformity. See my handicap. You can't expect me to do manual work. Next is conscious and unconscious. Adler defined the unconscious as the art is the part of the goal that is neither clearly formulated nor completely understood by the individual. Conscious thoughts are those that are understood and regarded by the individual as helpful in striving for success, whereas unconscious thoughts are those are not helpful. We cannot oppose consciousness to unconsciousness as if they were antagonistic halves of an individual existence the conscious life becomes unconscious as soon as we fail to understand it and as soon as we understand an unconscious tendency it has already become became conscious whether people's behavior lead to a healthy or unhealthy style of life depends on the degree of social interest that they develop during their childhood years. The fourth of Adler's tenets is the value of all human activity must be seen from the viewpoint of social interest. Social interests are innate potential to cooperate with other people to achieve personal and societal goals. Adler's term for this concept in the original German, Jamin Schaff Jufu, is best translated as community feeling. A person with well-developed Jamin Schaff Jufu strives not for not for personal superiority but for perfection for all people in an ideal community. Social interest can be defined as an attitude to relatedness with humanity in general as well as an empathy for each member of the com human community. It manifests itself as cooperation with others for social advancement rather than for personal gain. Social interest is the natural condition of the human species and the adhesive that binds society together. Origin of social interest Social interest is rooted as potentiality in everyone, but it must be developed before it can contribute to a useful style of life. It originates from the mother-child relationship during the early months of infancy. Adler believed that mother's rule was vital in developing the child's so social interest as well as other aspects of the personality. The mother's job is to develop a bond that encourages the child mature social interest and foster a sense of cooperation. Also, the father is the second important person in child's social environment. He must demonstrate a caring attitude toward his wife as well as to other people. 
Next is the importance of social interest. To Adler, social interest is the only gauge to be used in judging the worth of a person. As the bar barometer of normality, it is that it is the standard to be used in determining the usefulness of a, of a life. Social interest is not synonymous with charity and unselfishness. For example, some wealthy people give large sums of money to the poor and needy, not because they feel oneness to them, but because they may they maintain separateness from them the act of superiority Adler's fifth tenet is the self-consistent personality structure develops into a person's style of life let's go back to the question earlier in fictionalism so how in our daily lives do we try to attain this goal the ultimate goal for each of us is superiority or perfection or success, but we try to attain that goal through many different behavior patterns. Each of us expresses the striving differently. We develop a unique pattern of characteristics, behavior, and habits which Adler called a distinctive character or style of life. Or the flavor of a person's life. And the final tenet of Adlerian theory is style of life is molded by people's creative power. Each person Adler believed is empowered with the freedom to create her or his own style of life. Ultimately, all, pe all people are responsible for who they are and how they behave. Their creative power places them in control of their own lives, is responsible for their final goal, determines their method of striving for that goal, and contributes to the development of social interest. In short, creative power makes each person a free individual. Creative power is a dynamic concept implying movement, and this movement is the most salient characteristic of life. Application of Individual Psychology we have divided the practical applications of individual psychology into four areas. Fam one, family constellation, early recollections, dreams, and psychotherapy. Family constellation. Although people's perception of the situation into which they were born is more important than numerical rank, Adler did form some general hypothesis about birth order. Firstborn children, according to Adler, are likely to have intensified feelings of power and superiority, high anxiety, and overprotective tendencies. Secondborn children, such as himself, Adler, begin life in a better situation for developing cooperation and social interest. Youngest children, Adler believe, are often the most pampered and consequently run a high risk of being problem children. Only children, and last, only ch only children are in a unique position of competing, not against brothers and sisters, but against father and mother. Number two, early recollection. Adler insisted 
that early recollections are always consistent with people's pre present style of life and that their subjective account of these experiences yields clues to understanding both their final goal and their present style of life. Next, dreams. Although dreams cannot foretell the future, they can provide clues for solving future problems. Nevertheless, the dreamer frequently does not wish to, sh to solve the problem in a productive manner. Dreams involves our feelings about current problems and what we are intent to do about it. Dreams are oriented toward the present and the future, not the past. And lastly, psychotherapy. Adlerian theory postulates that psychopathology results from lack of courage, exaggerated feelings of inferiority, and underdeveloped social interest. Thus, the chief purpose of Adlerian psychotherapy is to enhance courage, lessen feelings of inferiority, and encourage social interest. For elucidation, this is Adler's image of human nature. Thank you for watching. Once again, I am Maria Cristina Buncalis, BSS the Volume One.